what is sort of the right way to do it that will lead in a good user experience for your customers, right? Not just about like what is good, you know, how can you implement this in a way that gets off your roadmap, but like what do we think would be truly like delight your customers? Welcome to Screaming in the Cloud. I'm Corey Quinn. My guest today on this promoted episode is brought to us by our friends at Oso. And what else is brought to us by Oso? That's right. Their CTO and co-founder, Sam Scott. Sam, thank you for joining me. Hey, Corey. Thanks for having me. Oso makes it easy for developers to build authorization into their applications. With Oso, you can model, extend, and enforce your authorization as your applications scale. Organizations like Intercom, Headway Product Board and PagerDuty have migrated to Oso to build fine-grained authorization backed by a highly available and performant service. Check out Oso today at osohq.com. That's O-S-O-H-Q.com. Instead of starting at the beginning, because that makes way too much sense, I want to pick up on something that I noticed about your background. Specifically, you have a PhD in cryptography, which uh, my, my biggest takeaway from this was always called Schneer's Law which is, as Bruce Schneer famously said, anyone can invent an encryption algorithm that they themselves cannot break. Uh, The takeaway, of course, is don't roll your own cryptography. And the other thing I try never to get involved with is rolling my own authentication. So you have a PhD in cryptography, and now you work for a company that does authentication. Are you just like effectively hanging out with a bad idea bear or something and coming up with these ideas? What, What is your life like? How did you get into this position? I mean, someone's got to solve those problems, and I, I, I like the hard problems. It's, they're the most fun ones. I, I will have to correct you immediately with the misconception that almost everybody makes. We work on authorization, not authentication. Excellent, excellent. And I want to begin with the, an even dumber question then. What is the difference between the two? So authentication is typically about identity, like who are you, right? You use name and password, single sign-on. Like how does the other person, the other side of you know, some interaction know who you are? That's like the authentication piece. Uh, authorization is normally what comes next. Like now that I know who you are, right? You're, you're Corey in some domain. I don't know you belong to some organization. Like okay, now I know who you are. What can you do? Right? Can you read such such documents? Do you have access to certain features? Things like that. In other words, great. So when I start uh, having too much to drink on a plane and ranting, like you don't know who I am. I'm Corey Quinn, and they'll say, yes, we know exactly who you are. No, you're not allowed to fly the plane. That is exactly right. Yeah. Got it. I somehow don't imagine that's going to be making it into one of your uh, one of your slide decks anytime soon. But no, it's it's an interesting problem. And someone that I once worked with in the early days of my career pointed out something that at the time I, a uh, wet behind the ears twenty something who of course knew better, scoffed at it. But they said that ultimately every every security and networking job in its final form, becomes about identity and access management. And I laughed and I laughed and he was really onto something in hindsight. Yeah. Uh, I mean, basically what you're summarizing is how I found out that my PhD was worthless. Uh, Have you heard the expression turtles all the way down? Oh, yes. The world stands out. What was it? What's the expression uh, with the entire, uh, there's some uh, mythology that said, oh, the entire world exists in the back of a turtle. Plausible as anything else. So what's the turtle standing on? Another turtle. It's turtles all the way down. Exactly. And so the same thing is true in in uh, insecurity, and and this is kind of what I found out with with working on like interesting cryptography, which is so like, I know some of the stuff I did was around like how do you make sure that like data is encrypted and like if the keys change you need to rotate them and so on and so on and so on. And like there's definitely some like interesting technical problems to work on. I had a lot of fun and built some fun maps. But when you get to like the in practice, what is hard about keeping data secure? It's like who has access to your keys in KMS and who has in KMS, right? Like. You can get those keys. If you can get the keys, it's game over, right? It doesn't matter what encryption standards you use and how frequently you're rotating your keys. It's a, oops, I wrote a, I wrote an access control rule that let somebody get access to the project encryption keys and now it's game over. And that's kind of where the authorization piece comes in, right? It's like, you know, are you making sure that the right people have access to the right things? Maybe not the bottom turtle, but it's definitely a pretty low one. I know that they're not the same thing as you just corrected me on, but I I can't shake the feeling that I'm not the only person that makes that mistake. Take AWS as a terrific example. Please take it. Take it somewhere far away from here. The problem that I have is that by authenticating that I am me to my AWS account, the only way that is expressed is in the form of credentials and ideally short-lived ones because I'm not a complete lunatic, but 
there's no distinction to my mind between yes, I have the credentials that prove I'm me, and, and also by extension, by being me, I therefore have access to do the following number of horrifying things. Yeah, deeply, deeply coupled and related problems, right? So it's the the kind of the one you describe, like you know, I you know, I authenticate, identify who I am, and like I belong to, I'm inside of an AWS organization or account, and that's going to give me access to a, a bunch of things by probably by default, right? Like almost every app in the world is going to have some amount of like authorization that's maybe not expressed very explicitly as like, this is authorization happening right now, but it's just a, you know, when, you know, when you go and read the database, you filter by an org ID or something like that. Like that is, that is authorization, but it's kind of implicit. It's like woven in, but it starts getting more and more interesting when you start getting to more like more complex, fine grained versions of that. Right. So Sure, you've done you've done some of the basics up front. You've identified you, you've put in your credentials, you get access to some things. But your AWS account probably has a ton of IAM rules describing the precise resources that you have access to at any given time. In fact, if you're doing things correctly and, and you know, maybe according to best practices, you might not even have access to things directly. You might have access to assume a role, and that role might grant you access to things. And that is another really good example of like authorization. It comes up everywhere, like role-based access control. The, the general idea being, instead of just describing what Corey can do, I say, well, Corey has this role, much much like other people in this organization do, and they can all collectively do the same kinds of things. Now, that's exactly what we do. And in most accounts that I have, that role uh, lets me assume administrator access. And the, the reason being is that I've always viewed AWS accounts as being the ultimate trust boundary. Because it doesn't matter if you just have developer rights and can never touch the things in the production side of that account. Things like service quotas, there's no way to restrict those. So suddenly you, you run out of a script that runs amok. You're not going to be able to suddenly auto scale in the production side of the environment. So there has to be that boundary there somewhere. We, I do this through IAM Access Identity Center. The source, of authentic, the source of identity is Google Workspaces. And then I wind up assuming roles based upon my group membership inside of that. And that gets me most of the way there. There are then additional roles we assume in client accounts where, surprise, I don't want to be able to break things there. So it tends to be very narrowly scoped to begin with, and we can scope that further when we have customers in particularly sensitive environments. We like do not break production or you're not allowed to save money anymore has always been our the, the thing that we've observed in our client accounts. But being able to, to assume those roles correctly and make sure that the right people who are working the right account have access, we don't just grant, oh, everyone here can have access to everything. We, for a small company, we do a remarkable amount of segmentation just because I, I, I've worked in regulated compliance at heavy environments before. You want to keep the sensitive stuff as narrowly contained as you can because then you don't really have to worry about access outside of those things. Well, okay, we have to make sure that all the discussion of the sensitive client stays within a, a, a given bounded area of Slack where only certain people can access. Great. So we codename everything and then it's a lot easier just because in case someone slips, we aren't suddenly not having to deal with data breach issues. Right, exactly. And so like building... Building an authorization system is all around, I guess, enabling users of your own product to be able to support the flows that make the most sense for them. And with something very like platformy, like in like an Amazon, right? Like naturally you're gonna to want to give your your users a lot of flexibility so they can tailor things to exactly how they're setting things up and building things. But in a lot of cases, well, you maybe you maybe want to give people like minimal configurability. You wanna just give them the typical path that they would take and not think about it too much, for example. So it's kind of a, a wide spectrum. Yeah, it's a because the problem that I found and this is where I start to get political on it. So you'll have to bear with me. But I've been saying for a while that Google is number one when it comes to security and AWS is number two. And Azure is did not finish. They're at the kids table eating crayons as they're going to do. Terrific. And the reason behind this is the usability approach. By default, anything in a Google Cloud project can talk to anything else in a Google Cloud project. That works terrifically well for me and disastrously for people at a bank. But by the time you're a bank, you have an InfoSec team that can disable that behavior and build in a uh, least access model, which is great. The danger of the AWS approach, and I gave a conference talk recently at an event that Wiz threw, that it was it was about an actual screenshot of something I have hanging out in my code build environment, where I have four or five different uh, policies assigned to it, and the last one that I added was administrator access, and there's a to do to go back and fix this later, and this was in 2018. I have not yet gotten to do that yet. 
And it's because you try to do something, it doesn't work. You expand, try again, doesn't work. And if you're doing this through something like CloudFormation, each iteration takes an hour. So great. By the time I was finally right, it was the hell with it. I just want this to go. That's the problem with continually failing to get the right permission dialed in. So you just say, just, just go ahead and give it to me everything. I'll deal with it in my own time. Yeah, you're, you're, you're preaching to the choir here. Yeah. Much like how roles can be this like pretty convenient authorization abstraction to like yeah, group, group people together based on similar things they do together. Th these are all admins, great. Like similarly on what I think about as like the resource management side, like the entities you have access to, having that ability to just like group things into some kind of hierarchy with like orgs and projects is like such a simple model for you to wrap the heads around, but like gets you so far. Like as you described, just being able to do that level of like opinionated structuring of, of permissions goes like a long, long way. Yeah, I'm very interested to to see how these problems evolve because it, the, what we're currently doing is not sustainable. Clearly, it's not. And I, the thing that I figured out as I went down this path early on when I started doing this independently is I turned my nose up at anything that would look like RBA, RBAC or SSO because I was independent. And I already have a great SSO thing that works. It's called 1Password. I stuff all of my passwords into it and things are great. The, where this starts to break down is when you start dealing with other people. How do you validate that everyone is using one password, for example? Well, when you mandate SSO, that solves some of these things and you have a single choke point to wind up uh, controlling access and enforcing MFA and the, and the like, whereas having to play whack-a-mole at other environments. That was something that I found to be extraordinarily challenging and I wish I'd done a bit differently setting out to do it. Yeah, in that it's it's nice to be able to have a single dashboard. When I bring someone on as a contractor to work on a project, for example, there are certain levels of, of granularity to permissions that they should have, and they vary from contractor to contractor. So having a catch-all contractors group doesn't work. It has to be, okay, are they a contract cloud economist? Okay, great. Which accounts are they working on? Make sure they only have access to those accounts. They still need access to shared stuff internally, but they probably don't need access to, for example, the employee portal and so on and so forth. And, and each one tends to be these bespoke things. And honestly, if I'm being direct, what we'll see is great. We just now have a pattern that we apply to most contractors that start based on the template that we built from our first contractor. Yeah, I think the world you're kind of getting towards here reminds me a lot of, of a lot of SAML. SAML, OAuth, SSO. These terms are inter these terms are inter uh, inter uh, are, I guess interact inter applicably just between things. All the documentation for all of these things, in my experience, presupposes that I have a directory management background. Everything one assumes I know what an OU is, which okay, great. Not everything lends itself to the OU model, especially when those OUs are not hierarchical and it becomes an obnoxious, painful problem. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, I think the thing that's nice about SSO in particular is because it, it creates, as you say, it creates that like pretty clean, convenient choke point where it's like, as an, as an implementer, I don't really need to care too much about how you authenticate. Like somebody else, your, your IT admin decided how someone should authenticate. And like, once you're in and authenticated, like I can kind of, continue on and do, you know, do, do the stuff that I care about. When you get into like trying to do that on an authorization standpoint, kind of, I mean, like you described, right? Bringing in Google Workspace groups to use those to determine which roles you can have access to. That's when you end up in the, like the gnarliest of gnarly, like federation problems where, yeah, you're, you're talking about three or four different standards, protocol specifications to implement, to get that data. Nobody does it in the same way, even though there is technically a standard. And then you need to go and use implement an interface inside your app that lets your users configure how they want to connect those different pieces of information up and decide what they can do with it. Right. Like I'm out of breath just trying just trying to talk about it. I know there is it's like it's like that classic you know XKC card cartoon like I'm just going to create a new specification that standardizes over all these things and build that one and then we have another new one and so, mm -hmm. and so on. So like, Congratulations, you just built the latest standards. No no one no one sets out trying to build something bespoke and unique. Like, ah, oh, we're going to build a unification thing. And unfortunately, it just doesn't work. So I think for us, like, I think it's, 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 you know, it's kind of a two-sided problem and both of which are hard. Like it is both hard to build a like authorization system that allows you to kind of bring in arbitrary external data and let people configure that and manipulate it into how they want to do authorization inside of your product. Like that side of it is already hard, let alone the like abstraction or unification of the like, you know, where, where that data comes from part. And so at least for us, also, like, you know, we, we can make progress on solving the first of those two problems. Can we make it easy for people to implement? Cool, I have groups from Google Workspaces and I want people to be able to use that inside of my products. We can, make, we can solve that half of it at least. 
that's the painful part. That's the thing that's hard in my experience to get right. It's the it's always the the new thing suddenly turns that your turns everything you've been doing on its head. And I think at enterprises this gets a lot easier because there aren't that many new worlds left to conquer. Uh, you you are not the first person who tries to expense a rental car at a company that has two thousand people. But when you're ten people, maybe you are when you grew during a pandemic. So I'm curious to know on some level what. What is it that you folks do exactly? I mean, so why should I use, why should I use OSA to wind up solving these problems? Because you already have some compelling uh, stories. Like, well, honestly, our logo is a bear and we're named after the Spanish word for bear. So terrific. The puns are going to be there for days. But that that drifts a little bit too much into my personal the bears. What are the, what are the reasons that, that you exist? What is it you solve for customers that hurts? Yeah, so the reason that we exist is, I think there are kind of probably two main reasons. So. So first of all, something that we just observed is that people have been reinventing this wheel of authorization again and again at like every single company they went to. They've spent like six months, 12 months, you know, multiple years re-implementing authorization within that company. Like how do people, you know, how do people get access to stuff inside of this product? Rebuilding, you know, organization roles, user groups, rebuilding, you know, the ability to share things with people and grant them access to it. Everyone's just like rewriting this code again and again and again from scratch. And so it just kind of seemed like one of those those obvious problems that like, what if there was just a, a company that could solve that for you? So that is like that side of it. We just like help take that implementation away from people. I know like I love authorization. I think it's a super interesting problem, but I don't think like every company in the world wants to be authorization experts in crush it. And so I think it's one of those problems that's like a really good fit for people to, to like help solve somebody else. I think the other half though maybe touches on some of what we've just been talking about, which is people don't Really, there hasn't people don't really talk about authorization a lot. They don't think about it a lot and like talk about what is good authorization and bad authorization and like have compared, you know, AWS I am, you know, Google Cloud approach much in depth. We have. We have like a lot of opinions on like what is the what is sort of the right way to do it that will lead in a good user experience for your customers. Right. Not just about like what is good, you know, how can you implement this in a way that gets off your roadmap, but like what do we think would be truly like delight your customers when it turns when it comes to being able to do authorization or not? And so those are kind of like two of the big problems that we help solve people. Take this piece of implementation work that your team would otherwise be spending, you know, potentially years on, and we do it for you as a service. Great. But we, we kind of almost work as like a, a partner with all our customers, like a design partner with all of our customers of like, you know, okay, what, you know, what are your customers trying to do? And like, can we, can we leverage the patterns that we've seen to help guide you on like making that not suck? There, it feels like there's a Goldilocks story here, as in, um, if nothing else, t-shirt sizing. You must be at least this tall to ride slash get value from Oso. And I'm wondering, is there a like, is there a sweet spot that you have for customer profiles around customer about company size or company level complexity? I should say. Yeah, there, there, there definitely is. Um, I mean, in the length of time, this thing will address where every every single person under the sun should obviously use Oso, right? Like that's we're a venture back company. That's our ambition, kind of thing. But it's true that like t- today, I think where we see our sweet spot is kind of two, two main categories of people, people who, who are maybe going up market, they're going after larger enterprises and they're realizing that they're getting like a ton of sales requests. Like, hey, to use your product, like we need to be able to segregate access within different teams or within different groups, right? Like we have sensitive data in, you know, this group are working on that this other group shouldn't get access to. And like, we'll see this, a lot of companies will start getting those requests, right? It's no longer enough that you log in and you have access to this the organization that that is sufficient. We need to start getting things more granular, right? So like companies that hit that point, with, you know, and it's, that's normally around like the size of customers they're going after. That's like a really good one. No one is excited by the prospect of building permissions except for the people at Oso. With Oso's authorization as a service, you have building blocks for basic permissions patterns like RBAC, RBAC, ABAC, and the ability to extend to more fine-grained authorization as your applications evolve. Build a centralized authorization service that helps your developers build and deploy new features quickly. Check out Oso today at osohq.com. Again, that's osohq.com. When I uh, wound up working at my first startup, I was their first non-developer technical hire, which is always a weird place to find yourself in. But I wound up picking up a lot of good patterns that I carried with me forward from that. One of them was that when our auditors showed up, because we were in the payment space, they asked us like how they authenticated to the Wi-Fi. It's like, oh, great. The password is on the wall. And they stared at me like, "Uh oh, that's not going to be good. Like, OK, so what? where's your active directory or what now? 
like, I'm sorry, this is not a Windows shop. And they said, okay, let me distill this down for you in very simple terms. Once I'm on the Wi-Fi, what does that grant me access to? And the answer was the internet and that printer over there. They're like, wait, okay, but from the office, you can wind up then getting special access into other things. Like, no, that sounds like something an insane person might do. We wind up instead either using a VPN if we're trying to get into something sensitive, or more commonly, every API endpoint is hardened and we authenticate with signed requests on all of them. And they're like, I've never seen that before. And it's, yeah, the reason we did it is because everything that did the traditional gateway stuff was really expensive. And we'll we'll see how this works out. Now, apparently, it's called Zero Trust or Beyond Corp, and everyone uh, pushes it as a best practice. And during the pandemic, we saw the VPN concentrators and a lot of enterprises start melting out of their racks when everyone used them at once. But that was a... But it was sort of an interesting, almost by accident. It's easy to sit here and say, oh, because I was a visionary. No, because I was cheap and didn't really know any better. No, I, I see that kind of playing out a lot. It, it, it does remind me of like an interesting or an important clarification I want to make because I think probably I take this difference for granted, but it's probably not one that everybody um, does who's listening to this. The kind of thing you're talking about is sort of internal company authorization, maybe like even like infrastructure or platform authorization, like within. You know, for, for us, it'd be like, within OSO, what, what, what do I have access to? Like, what, you know, AWS service can I access? Or, like, which products can I access? And, you know, which, can I get to the email? Can I talk to the printer? Stuff like that. Like, that's all, like, internal to the business. What can you get access to? The authorization that we typically focus on is for companies building B2B SaaS products, right? Like, you're building a, and let's say GitHub. It's an example we use a lot, right? You're, you're building GitHub. What authorization do you let your users do? Like how how can you know how do people authorize or get access to things within the GitHub products? Right? Like you can access GitHub organizations, you can maybe access certain repositories, I can set roles at different levels within an organization that means you can push to repositories or not. Like so for people who are building those SaaS products like a GitHub, we're helping implement that kind of authorization like within that product. It's almost like you're skipping ahead in my notes as far as things I wanted to talk about, because this is exactly where we're headed with the conversation. Because one thing that AWS did or Amazon did in the early 2000s, which I thought was great, is Bezos passed by decree the idea that every company talks to each other via hardened APIs with the expectation that those things can become public at any time. And that caused some great things and some terrible things, too. Like, it turns out when you don't have a company holistically talking to each other as humans, you wind up with travesties like the billing system. But that's neither here nor there. The painful part, though, is that I think comes from a lot of cases where companies treat internal authorization versus customer authorization as very different things. Things and there are times you can't escape it, but increasingly as I get older, that feels more and more like an anti pattern. I, I think it's because the idea that once you wind up with a trusted network or a trusted inside group of people who are employees, you on some level wind up with a M&M style security. You've hardened the perimeter and then you no longer feel the need to wind up defending on um, anything inside of that perimeter. Now, in many cases, this is a good thing. There's a reason that Slack doesn't have a block button. It's because you, you if that's it, I've had enough. I never want to hear from those bastards in accounting ever again is all well and good, but you can't really have a functional business business when that's the kind of thing that happens. Whereas I never want to hear from these people in public again who say mean things about me on the internet. Ahem, ahem. Okay, that's a bit more understandable. But for some reason, I've always had the impression that treating employees as once you're in the in-group you're in is a security misstep. I think I understand. So you're saying like when you are building a product, like you're building, you're building something in GitHub, like you shouldn't, you should treat employees access to things within GitHub the same as external people's access to GitHub. Yes. Now, maybe there are permission groups that can only apply to people who have a GitHub employee flag set in their profile, but the way they log in, the way that identity gets passed out should absolutely not be a sidecar system. Now, yes, you need a break glass way for them to get access to things. If if that identity system is what breaks, you'd better have a way to get in and fix that quickly. But as a standard operating procedure, yeah, going in the front door the way that your customers do uh, first means you don't have to build and maintain separate systems for this that are going to, uh, to diverge. And two, when there are customer side issues with this, you'll see them because they impact you as well. Yeah, no, that's a really great point. And that one is a, I mean, just the reason people don't is like, it's hard to, it's really hard to implement that well, because to do so, you need to have a authorization system that's like flexible to 
handle, you know, potentially suddenly users who can have access to like multiple accounts. And like, as we kind of spoke about right at the beginning, like the easiest thing to do is you just hard code, someone logs in and they only have access to the account they belong to. If you now suddenly have like a support user who needs to go and like debug a customer account and they should get some limited access to that customer account, that just like, that suddenly like undermined like the entire way that you implement authorization inside your company and like gonna require you like implementing all kinds of like hacks and workarounds to make that happen. Something called like impersonation, right? The ability for like a customer support person to be able to like impersonate a user so they can kind of see what they would do and get access to some things that they would get access to. Doing that well basically either requires you having like a lot of extra code to kind of like handle these different special cases. And it ends up does doing, it just ends up being a different code path just in a different way. Or you need to have like a very sort of powerful, generic, flexible authorization system that can treat, hey, can this user access this other thing as a generic question, regardless of like how they get access to. And so like, yes, tooting us as well, like we support that kind of situation like really nicely. You, you treat all users the same. You can have a user with a global admin, super admin case, right? You're like an early stage startup and you say, yeah, I don't, I don't know how to access everything. You have a global super admin and they can access everything. But like over time, you can implement things like, you know, support agent can get access to this customer's account. If the, you know, if there's an open support ticket for that customer and they've been assigned to it, right? Like you can start writing like very granular logic that where the sweet spot is for that like internal custom support person, there's like zero friction to them seeing the things they need to see. Oh crap, I'm assigned a ticket. It's fine. I go to see that customer. I can see all the things, but they don't suddenly have access to like every company under the sun. Yeah. That, that's where it gets weird. Yeah. That's, that's where it gets it gets a bit concerning and strange, exactly. And even in the areas of the of the uh, internal infrastructure where every, every employee has access to stuff, there are things you want to be very guarded about. Uh, even my business partner, the CEO, does not have access to uh, Writable, to any of the audit logs, for example. I do at the moment, but I, uh, as far as I can, they're not mutable, but there are, I know, ways around these things. But again, I... I own the company. What am I going to do? Does I do this against myself? But there, there will be ways that we wind up sharding that in the future. Sometimes at clients, what I see is we go into optimize their AWS account and there's a carve out, sometimes a separate organization, sometimes a series of accounts because people with access to one are not allowed to touch the other, which great. Awesome. Usually that's the security boundary. And you take a look at it. It's less than 10% of spend. So great. Awesome. Let them do what they're going to do. We'll work around them. I love seeing that pattern. You know, and it reminds me, going, going back to the turtles analogy, I said authorization isn't quite the bottom turtle. The bottom turtle in my mind is lawyers because ultimately all of these technical approaches, right? At some point, there's going to be some layer at which like you can't guarantee that nobody can ever do a thing. Generally at that point, that's where lawyers come in or auditors where you, you know, sign a document saying or a policy saying that I do not do these things. And if I do, like, I think you hold me accountable to it. So like, yeah, you're right. Like at a certain point, you have to have like some boundary where somebody can like break glass, do a thing. But generally, uh, you write a policy and you let lawyers enforce it. One of our early uh, attorneys, uh, who, one of the first general counsel we had here, was uh, probably sort of better understanding of defense in depth than most uh, security people I know. And his advice was very simple. Uh, he's like, do not lose your shirt in business. Here are four things you do. Use them in this order. Step one, be a nice person. People don't want to sue their buddy. Two, have good contracts when that's for when that breaks down. Step three. Three, have insurance so that this covers these things when that turns against you. And step four, have a legal entity so you don't lose your house when things completely go to custard. That's the shell. Use them in that order. And yeah, that's the that's the way to think about these things. Because if you just go out there and say, oh, we don't need contracts or insurance or legal entity because I'm a nice person and everyone likes me. That's not going to work super well. Let me rephrase. That works super well until one day, all of a sudden, it very much does not. It's like, I don't think the house is going to burn down, but I have fire insurance on it. So uh, one last question I have before we call this an episode for you, which is that I'm trying to understand what your adoption looks like. I have to imagine you get no greenfield environments because I have an idea. I'm going to build something and see if it works. No one's thinking about security on the first step for that, unless it's a security company, in which case they think about security sooner than most, but still not soon enough to suit how most people think about these things. There's always some means that people are using to authenticate and then validate that they have authorization to do things. How do you roll out in an environment where things are, I guess, already pre-existent. So, I mean, first of all, like you'd be surprised. There are a lot of there are a good amount of people who they start a company and they had so much pain from authorization previously, and they knew that it's going to be important to them because they're in 
yeah, I say security or health tech or fintech. And they're like, you know what? I want to get this out of the way before we do anything else because I've seen how bad it can be if you wait. Well, that does happen as well. But coming back to your, to your question, though, like, you know, how do, how do people like it maybe adopt this incrementally or micro? Um, there's a kind of a few parts of this. So one, like what we often, what we often kind of help people do um, is adopt this incrementally by like implementing the net new functionality they care about, right? So maybe it's, Maybe they're migrating from monoliths to microservices and they want to start seeing like, how do I have an authorization microservice? Like we'll help them do that part while maybe keeping the existing stuff running as it is. It might be a case of, you know, they've already got multiple services and they've, you know, they're, they're rolling out a new, a new service that's going to require some new functionality and some new capability. We'll say, okay, like let's just implement it into that one new service. Let's do that new stuff that you couldn't previously do. That was going to take you, you know, have a long, you know, six months, 12 months in your roadmap to like roll out that new you know, sharing capability before you add this new microservice, like we'll help you do that piece on that one service so you can kind of see it, see the patterns. And then we can like gradually start bringing over the old stuff over time. I, I lied to you. I did have one more question I wanted to get into, and I'm, I'm worried of how this might uh, wind up shaking out. You recently wound up rolling out something called distributed authorization. And the reason I'm nervous to talk about it is I'm concerned it might be some blockchain horseshit. Well, yeah, no, don't worry, it's not. Would have been awkward otherwise. Yeah, the cryptography in my PhD has zero to do with the blockchain side of crypto, which is why I had to call it PhD in cryptography and not PhD in crypto, which makes me sad. But yeah, no, so dis- distributed authorization. Uh, it's it's something we're pretty excited about because we've been kind of wanting to release it since the beginning of something also like four or five years ago of like how we think authorization should work. And it's called distributed authorization as a contrast to centralized authorization. So like historically... People, if they want to have some kind of like consistent way of doing authorization across the company, across multiple services, they put everything in a central microservice, um, all the authorization logic, they put all the data that's necessary, which can often end up being like a lot of data, right? It's, you know, all of the, all of the user data and the roles they have, it's, you know, all the resources you want to have access to, right? And in Google Cloud, right? It'd be all the projects and all the resources and all the projects they belong to, right? All of that data gets like shoved into this like central service and you have an API that says, can I use it to do a thing or not? That was kind of the old way. It was kind of painful because it really went against microservice best practices of how you like you ideally want to kind of decouple and draw good boundaries between services. It had this like horrible coupling where you're synchronizing and sending all your data centrally. But it was kind of the only way to get a consistent authorization implementation at, at like a at like a large large scale. What we've done with distributed authorization is we've basically made it possible for people to integrate a consistent authorization implementation into individual services while leveraging the data those services already have and own and manage. So rather than going through this process of like synchronizing and send, sending all this data centrally, you can just like roll out authorization in one of those services, leveraging the data you already have. Doesn't that dramatically increase the attack surface? Uh, it, you wind up effectively without the central source of truth that you are that you are guarding on some level. You ignoring the split brain problems of distributed systems and effect of how you establish quorum. Uh, I guess you could re-implement Paxos for fun. Why not? You have a PhD in this sort of thing anyway. It'll be fine. No, what I'm trying to figure out is, does that mean that you have to be a lot more guarded as far as, uh, there's no longer a central, uh, I guess, crown jewel area. Suddenly, everything becomes a theoretical tax point, doesn't it? Not really. I mean, in, in, like, in the sense that with a central service, you can already like forget to call the API or just ignore what the API tells you. Like you're already trusting that the services enforcing the authorization are actually going to check your service and do something with it. Like there's already that amount of trust here. But I think though there is an interesting distinction, which is the so the logic for who can do what in this world still lives inside that central authorization service. You have one place to look at the logic, you have one place to audit who can do what. It's mostly just the data piece that is now being deferred to like handle inside the database. So like when I actually go and fetch a list of kind of servers that you have access to based on projects it belongs to, that might just happen in the database that you have already built rather than inside the central service. So there's like just a little bit of like where the processing happening is different. And in both cases, you're still getting a full audit log of the authorization that took place. So with OSO, right, like every, every time someone goes and makes an authorization call, or all the servers that I can, I can I have access to, We'll audit log that that request took place. Like, who, you know, what was the user? What they're trying to do, and what was the data that we would have gone and looked up to answer that question? That makes sense. I have to imagine that's rather compelling for people who have bought into your vision of of, of authorization. Yeah, I mean, this this feature came from a lot of you know feedback from customers who really 
people really want this. Like, I want to put authorization behind an API. I want to call that. I don't want my teams to go and re-implement everything from scratch every single time to go and do it. It's like, that's the thing they're trying to get towards. But forever, like for a long time, it came with this like big cost of, okay, but to do that, you just go around to every single team and tell them, here's how to get the data into the service so that it can do those things for you. And so I think like removing that whole part of the conversation, I think is, is like pretty exciting for people. They can now go to their team and be like, hey, we have taken care of that authorization thing for you. You don't need to think about commissioning and roles and groups and all that kind of stuff. We're just going to give you a library that you implement, client library, an API that you're going to implement, like integrate into your app and you're good. You're done. We've got it. We're going to audit things. We're going to review things. Like, don't worry about that. You can just like carry on and do things happily, which I think will really change how people think about adopting authorization. I look forward to seeing how this winds up evolving. Thanks for taking the time to speak with me about it. If people want to learn more, where's the best place for them to find you? Yeah. Well, so yeah, thank you for having me here. And I mean, all this information is at osohq.com. Uh, from there, there's like a couple of paths you can go down. We have a ton of educational content for developers like Authorization Academy. Um, if any of this kind of, you know, if we went too fast, I know I speak pretty fast, you can kind of read that stuff in depth. You can go and just start trying out the OSO product for free. Like, you know, there's just this, you know, an unlimited free trial. You can just sign up for and try out. Uh, and we also have like a Slack community. If you want to like get into a bit more of a discussion and you're kind of thinking through some thoughts, but you have not talked about them, we've got a safe space for you to talk about authorization. So you can find all that from OSOHQ.com. And we will, of course, put links to all of that in the show notes. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to have this conversation with me. I, I really appreciate it. Thanks Sam Scott, CTO and co-founder at Oso Security. This promoted guest episode of Screaming in the Cloud has been brought to us by Same. And I'm cloud economist Corey Quinn. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. If you've hated this podcast, please leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice, along with an angry, insulting comment that makes sure to start with the phrase, don't you know who I am? <laughs>